Good morning. We are the Active Noise Cancellation Team, and I'm going to be talking about our project with you today. Uh, there's two kinds of noise cancellation. There's passive noise cancellation and active noise cancellation. And passive noise cancellation will use the, uh, the insulation on your headphones. So, so in noise canceling headphones, you could have insulation that would block out the noise. Um, active noise cancellation uses that insulation, but it also uh, generates a signal that will destructively interfere with any noise that's in the environment. Um, so our project is active noise cancellation. Um, active noise cancellation is also adaptive, usually, um, meaning that it can adapt to when the noise frequencies might change. So our system can follow a noise frequency and produce a countertone which destructively interferes with the, the noise itself. And uh, that destructive interference will be close to your ear, so that when you turn on the headphones, uh, the noise will uh, lower in volume. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Mike, and he's going to talk about how the algorithm works. So, uh, over here I have a block diagram on the board. And you can see we have our, the, the system starts here with our input signal. So it takes in our undesired or uh, noisy signal. It goes into the LMS, which produces the first round of weights for the fur filter. The fur filter then takes these weights from the LMS, uh, uses them to produce a counter signal, and then the counter signal uh, gets outputted into our system, into our headphones, and then in the environment, uh, the counter signal and the addition of the input signal um, should produce something much quieter but there will be some sort of result. Uh, that result is the error of our system, and that comes back into the LMS. The LMS then uses the error that it received from the, that first iteration and the previous iterations uh, with the input signal to produce the next round of weights. So to further explain that, I have these equations written out here. So this first one is the LMS equation. So how it calculates the new weights is it takes the, the current weights and it adds them to, a, to the input signal multiplied by the error. Um, and there is also a step size here, which I will get to in a little bit. So the error here, um, as soon as the error gets minimized, the, the ideal case would be the error would go to zero. At that point, the weights would end up just being equal to their previous values and the system would become stable and then we would have our 180 degrees um, shifted countertone. So these weights that are produced by the LMS then come into the fur filter. This fur filter is a, uh, is a sum of products. So it multiplies, it's, a, it's just a, a little window of the signal that it multiplies the weights by that window of the input signal. And that goes for the order of the filter. So if we had a five tap filter, it would just do um, five iterations of this. If it was a 32 tap filter, it would do 32 iterations of this. What's produced by this is the counter signal. Um, it's also uh, important to say that the LMS produces symmetrical weights. So the fur filter is a linear phase fur filter. The signals that come out of this fur filter can only be zero degrees or 100 degrees out of phase with that input signal, um, which can help help account for a lot of the, handles a lot of the phase um, and delay issues that can arise. So then the counter signal gets sent out of our system, gets added to the input signal, and that's the error that comes back into the LMS. So over here, I have a small quadratic to help explain how the, the LMS uh, tries to work. So if the LMS were to start up here, um, the it, it eventually would come down and it would converge to a certain point. So we will never get to this ideal error of an ideal error of zero. What will happen is, based on that step size, that mu, it will jump past the error and the LMS will realize that we're now growing in the wrong direction, that the error is getting larger. So it will jump back in the other direction and have this oscillation effect at the bottom of this quadratic here. Uh, so with the larger step size, the oscillation will be bigger, and so you'll see a kind of bouncing of the signal a little more. With a smaller step size, it'll converge slower, but you'll have a, a, a smaller oscillation here at the bottom. So at this point, I'd like to give it over to Artaza. Uh, 
We will also like to thank Dr. Lukoviak for giving us the Vertex 5 FPGA code with DSP slices. Rick Tollison for giving us the HG668B headphone. Dr. Amuzo and Dr. Boulder for giving us the omnidirectional microphones. So here's a demo of our system. We have our frequency tone being generated for, by a speaker here at 220 hertz. This is coming through our external microphone. The system's currently off. As you see, there's no signals being produced. Here we have our, our feedback system with our air microphone coming in here. And this is our enclosure for our box. It's equipped with uh, access to the ports that you would need, a single on-off switch, and a reset button here on the top. So when we turn the system on, the power comes on and it produces a countertone within three seconds. So here you can see on the top here is the, the signal that's coming out of here, the 220 hertz hot sine wave. And then right below it is the 180 degrees out of phase countertone. We also have a reset switch. So when you press the reset switch, it will, it will flatline the signals and then it comes back on within three seconds as well. We can also change the frequency, frequency range of our tone, and you can see it growing, shrinking, and, and following the tones as they go. And something else that's nice to see, you can see it actively produce uh, uh, countertones to white noise in the background here, just by blowing into the microphone. Okay, for your engineering requirements, uh, your first one was user interface will consist of a single on-off switch. And we saw that yes. on the box. Okay. The design process will be well documented. It's been well documented. <laughs> uh, we've, we're, uh, we've documented our code as, as, as we've been writing it, um, so it should be easy to follow. And uh, we'll uh, be finishing up our report and uh, make sure that that follows our standards as well. Uh, upon power up, the system will counteract noise signals which fall between 40 hertz and 80 hertz. Yeah, so for our demo, uh, we did a 220 hertz signal on the ones around that. For, for that particular demo, just so you can see the signals on the oscilloscope well, that frequency happens to work. For our other demos, we can go through the whole frequency range, not just the 60 to 80, but we can go above, you know, quite a bit above that. Um, so yes, it can it can do the sixty to eighty. It's so what are the ranges that it that you've tested it with? It seems to drop off around thirty seven hertz, and I'm not sure the high end it was. We've gone up to maybe one kilohertz. Um, we haven't tested a whole lot um, above that. Okay, um, some physical features: the output will be through a 3.5 millimeter stereo jack, yes. <laughs> which we see go into the head jack. Yep. Uh, the cost of the system will not exceed $1,000 per academic unit. So our academic expense is $874. Most of that is the FPGA itself. The processor and all internal connections must be enclosed in a hard case with dimensions no more than four inches larger than the dimensions of the FPGA on each side. So it's, it fits in the box, and the box isn't much larger than the actual um, development board that we're using. It's un what, under four inches. The system must contain two microphones, an FPGA, necessary wires, a headset, and a hard case. I think we saw all that. Yes. The headphones must be able to detect frequencies in the range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Yes. yes. That's the specs. The system must consume less than 0.3 kilowatt hour, uh, kilowatts on average. So the, it consumed uh, 0 0.008 kilowatts uh, on average. Okay. And the system must not exceed a peak instantaneous power of 10 watts. It stayed at 7.6. <laughs> I'll fluctuate it down between 7.4 and 7.6 over a 30 hour duration is what we tested. A drop in the volume of the noise signal must be detected by 85% of individuals who test the system. Yeah. So 
We haven't finished our poll because we did some last minute changes. Mm -hmm. We've polled nine individuals. We have eight passes and one fail, giving us 89% and on target for our, uh, for our projected uh, survey and desired results. Okay. Uh, the delay between the point at which the system is powered on and the noise signal is canceled will not exceed three seconds. So you mentioned that during your demo, and we saw it respond. Uh, the volume of the counter signal will not exceed 85 decibels. So we were able to test this through a phone app that had really good reviews. Uh, uh, we had it produce some awful noises, as it was, uh, but the, 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 the system output ended up being 64 decibels. Um, yeah, maximum for the calibrated system. And the system must be able to interact with two microphone inputs, either through line inputs or GPIO pins. Obviously, your system comprises two microphones and you're using them, so yes. that works. Anything else you'd like to see about your project? We would have liked to uh, ultimately get a little bit more noise cancellation out of it. It was uh, an interesting problem, and noise can active noise cancellation is much more difficult than we initially anticipated. So it's also hard to come up with uh, a working and usable uh, noise demo for, for those to see. So. Yeah. Well, we found that you can see that we can create a signal that's 180 degrees out of phase, um, but we found that the project itself is more than just that. It's dealing with um, the amplitudes of the signal, so that when you're listening to it in the headphones, is it louder than the noise that's outside? Um, dealing with that, um, and, uh, it was a more, a little more complex problem than we thought it was going to be in that case. But as you can see, that you know the end goal of creating that counter signal 180 degrees out of phase, that destructive interference we were able to do, is just making the sound that way um, was a little more complex problem than we originally anticipated. What about any, um, so other than that, what other challenges might you face if you might, wanted to make it a commercial product? Uh, well, patents would definitely be one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the kind of algorithms that we're using uh, are patented by places like Bose. Um, you know, the system using microphones to pick up noise signals, there's patents on those kind of things. Uh, if you want to go into production, you'd also have to do more of a PCB approach. We're using an FPGA development board right now. Um, we're only using a small part of that, so we'd actually have to get the chip and you know, the audio codec chip that we use, the GPIO, we'll put that on a PCB, so that would be another challenge. We are running into, when we try to get very clear signals um, with a fast convergent rate, uh, it's proven to be pretty difficult. And uh, so there's a, there's a trade-off between uh, the amount of signal you cancel and how fast you can cancel it. So a DSP would actually be uh, a better choice here. And so if we were to commercially do it, we'd probably switch to uh, DSP versus the FPGA. <laughs> so that we'd have a little bit more uh, signal processing power. All right, thank you. All right, so this is the insides of our um, box. You can see that most of it is the FPGA development board. Um, the chip itself that we're using is this thing under the heat sink. And so we're using this chip and we're using an audio, audio codec that's right here, which is a mu much smaller chip, and then we're just using the ports. So as you can see, we're not using a whole lot of this board. So it would actually be much smaller if we were going to produce it. Uh, we have this set to the main reset switch of the development board. Um, so these wires coming in here, there's, there's the two microphone buses of wires. Um, so these go into GPIO pens on the development board. And uh, we're actually using a protocol called I2S to communicate with the uh, microphones. It's, it's similar to uh, I2C. It's a, um, a serial audio uh, protocol. So those wires are coming in here. We're able to communicate with the microphones. Uh, one interesting thing is that the microphones themselves actually kind of show you you can see um, you can see we have a cover on this one but the the microphone itself this there's actually a PCB board and the microphone itself is even smaller than that so it's a very small chip um, but built into that is uh, a way to, to capture the noise but also it has a analog to digital converter so 
it converts the, the data to, di um, to digital already and then uses this protocol to communicate with our system on the board and uh, that's how we get the data across. So it's actually a pretty cool little um, design that, that we're able to use. Um, but that is pretty much all that we have in here. It's, a, it's relatively simple on the outside. A lot of the complicated part is the algorithms that are running on the FPGA here. What about your headphone setup? So we have this. This is a mic we use to reference. This is we uh, the noise signal comes in in this one. So this is trying to figure out what frequency are we trying to cancel. And then we have this set here. So here's our headphone set. You can see that there's wires going in here. We have another microphone that goes into the ear cup of these headphones. And this is our air microphone. So this is hearing what you hear when you have these headphones on. And it's trying to figure out how much of the noise is still there so that it can adjust itself to, uh, to counter it better. So it's trying to find that minimum that Mike was talking about earlier in the demo. Uh, so both of these microphones, these wires, are running through into the box and um, they're all communicating with the board through the I2S protocol.